Hello everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel, Dr. Barkis of Thalmodic Tutorials. First of all, I am sorry because I could not make videos in the last three weeks as I got busy with the work at Medical College as well as because of my personal commitments. So today we will discuss about a very short but very important and interesting topic that is trophic corneal ulcers. So this can also be called as the non-infectious type of corneal ulcers. So in this we have the neurotrophic keratopathy as well as the exposure keratopathy. So the word trophic is derived from the Greek word troph which means that the nutrition or the food or the nourishment to any of the structures. So in the trophic ulcer, the nourishment of the corneal epithelium is hampered, hence it is called as the trophic corneal ulcers. So in this we have the neurotrophic corneal ulcer as well as the exposure keratopathy. So in this video we will be discussing about the neurotrophic keratopathy or the neurotrophic corneal ulcer under the headings of pathogenesis, what are the various causes for this trophic ulcers, clinical features that is signs and symptoms as well as the management of this trophic corneal ulcer. So without much delay, let's begin our video on trophic corneal ulcers. So when you hear the word the trophic corneal ulcer, the first thing which strikes your mind is there is something to do with the trigeminal nerve innervation. So, so this pathogenesis of this trophic ulcer is really interesting. So first of all, the root cause is there is damage to the trigeminal nerve. So initially they thought that there is a process of dry eye which is happening which is the cause for the corneal ulcer. Later, they found out that there is something called as the bidirectional control for the epithelial growth of the cornea. The control with respect to both the sensory innervation as well as the sympathetic innervation to the cornea is needed for the epithelial proliferation of the cornea. And in experimental animals, they have found that after denerving the cornea, that is experimentally they have cut the trigeminal nerve and they studied the cornea. So what happened there was like there was decreased limbal stem cells in the cornea. Okay. So whenever there is decreased limbal stem cells, the new epithelial cell proliferation of the mitosis of the corneal epithelium is decreased. Thereby, the old epithelial cells are dying but it is not replaced with the new epithelial cells and that is the reason for the trophic corneal ulcer. So there is decreased limbal stem cells because there is no a link. So there is decreased limbal stem cells. So as the new epithelial cells usually proliferate centripetally from the periphery to the center, so the center has the most of the old corneal epithelial cells. So, they will, so these will desquamate and lead to the corneal ulcer. So that is one of the reasons why this trophic corneal ulcer is more common in the center of the cornea as well as the inferiorly exposed area of the cornea. And one more theory which explains the pathogenesis of the trophic corneal ulcer is like whenever there is damage to the trigeminal nerve, there is disturbance in the metabolic activity of the corneal epithelial cells. So there is accumulation of all the metabolites in the corneal epithelium only which will subsequently lead to the edema of the corneal epithelial cells as well as the exfoliation of the shedding of the corneal epithelial cells thereby leading to the ulcer formation. Even the animal studies have shown that because of the corneal denervation there is increased tear film osmolarity because the epis part of the tear film is decreased in these patients of the trophic corneal ulcer there is increased tear film osmolarity which is again adding to the pathogenesis of the trophic corneal ulcers. So this is about the pathogenesis. So in the theories of the pathogenesis of the trophic ulcers we had the dry eye as the cause first because of this trigeminal nerve damage there is damaged the bidirectional reflex which is very much needed for the corneal epithelial cells to divide and proliferate. And the third was the accumulation of the metabolic products in the corneal epithelial cells thereby leading to the edema and the exfoliation. And the fourth one was because of the decreased aqueous co-production in the tear film there is increased osmolarity of the tear film which will add to the pathogenesis of the trophic corneal ulcer. Coming to the causes of this neurotrophic corneal ulcer, so this is frequently asked as a three mark question to enumerate the causes for the trophic corneal ulcer. So we have the congenital causes as well as the acquired causes. In the congenital, the relayed eye syndrome, I will be explaining at the end of this video. Then the congenital insensitivity to the pain, okay, and anhydrotic ectodermal dysplasia. So these three are the congenital causes for the trophic corneal ulcer. And in the acquired causes, it can be divided like the surgical trauma to the eye, like in case of penetrating keratoplasty or in case of the large limbal incisions or even following the LASIK, there can be damage to the limbal epithelial cells, thereby leading to the trophic corneal ulcer. 
Then the cerebrovascular accidents like multiple sclerosis, aneurysms and even the tumors like the acoustic neuroma or the neurofibroma, all these can lead to the damage to the trigeminal nerve. Infection and this is the important cause for this neurotrophic ulcer. As you know, the herpes zoster ophthalmicus as well as the herpes simplex keratitis can lead to damage to the gazerian ganglia and leading to the trophic corneal ulcer as well as the Hansen's disease that is leprosy and even the syphilis can lead to the trophic corneal ulcer. And the fourth one we have the topical medications like the topical anesthetic usage or the beta blockers like uh, timolol, metoxolol, even the NSAID drops as well as the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors can lead to corneal hypesthesia. And even the systemic disease that is diabetes mellitus both type 1 and type 2 can lead to trophic corneal ulcer because of chronic hypoglycemia. And the trigeminal neurology as you all know the treatment for which is sometimes the alcohol blockage to the glycerin ganglion which will lead to denervation of the corneal leading to trophic corneal ulcers. In the symptoms of this trophic corneal ulcer what you should remember is there is no pain and there is no lacrimation which are the characteristic feature of trophic corneal ulcer. So the patient can have red eyes or there can be swollen eyelids and even the decreased vision depending upon the extent of cornea but there is no pain and there is no lacrimation. Okay? So coming to the signs of this trophic corneal ulcer, when you check the vision there can be decreased vision depending upon the extent of the ulcer, the lids there can be edema or the swollen eyelids and the conjunctiva will show the ciliary congestion or the circumcorneal congestion. When you come to the corneal examination per se, you will see the typical features of the trophic corneal ulcer. Coming to the corneal signs in trophic corneal ulcer, initially to begin with the corneal sheen is lost. So the cornea looks dull. So which is the more common site as I explained, it is more common in the center of the cornea as well as the inferiorly exposed part of the cornea. So the main thing what is happening in the cornea is there is deep squamation of the corneal epithelial cells which are not equally replaced by the new epithelial cells. So there is desquamation which is leading to the punctate epithelial erosions. Okay. So there is minor punctate epithelial erosions in the cornea which will eventually coalesce and form a frank epithelial defect. Okay. So this epithelial defect can be in the center or in the inferior part or it can involve whole of the cornea leaving just the peripheral rim of the cornea intact. Okay. And later on this epithelial defect will form into the corneal ulcer. So whenever you see a patient with herpes zoster symptoms, the herpes zoster ophthalmicus symptoms, carefully check for the corneal sensation just to assess the risk of developing the trophic corneal ulcer. When the patient is having active herpes zoster infection, the corneal sensations may be decreased drastically but it will settle down to some extent but still there is defect in the corneal sensation. So that can predispose these patients for the trophic corneal ulcers. And in case of herpes simplex keratitis patient, these patients will have persistent epithelial defect but there is no active viral replication or there is no active inflammation. But these patients will have persistent epithelial defect then you should think of the neurotrophic corneal ulcer where the treatment is different. Okay? So if you think of HSV keratitis and treat in the line of antivirals, the patient may not respond. Okay? So think of trophic corneal ulcer whenever there is persistent epithelial defect in post HSV keratitis. And one more peculiarity about this trophic corneal ulcer is in spite of the effective treatment and the cornea has healed and it has formed a scar, in spite of that this scar can quickly break down and again lead to the trophic ulcer formation. The relapses are the rule in case of trophic corneal ulcers. So the signs which I have explained are again divided clinically into different stages that is stage 1, stage 2 and stage 3 which include the various signs which is shown in the table. So coming to the management of this trophic corneal ulcer, so the management usually involves the investigations as well as the treatment but in the trophic corneal ulcers there is no specific investigation just try to find out the cause for this trophic corneal ulcer or the cause for this trigeminal nerve dysfunction and if you can find the cause try to treat the cause wherever it is possible then the treatment is in line of dry eye treatment like you should give plenty of lubricating eye drops as well as the lubricating eye ointment which are preservative free like benzalconium chloride which is used as a preservative and as you all know the other treatment options in the corneal ulcer like the cycloplegic drugs as well as the topical antibiotics you can use and with a plenty of lubricating eye drops treat the trophic corneal ulcer if not then go for matrix metalloprotein inhibitors like the tetracyclines which are given to prevent the melting of the cornea okay you can also go for corneal collagen cross-linking which will strengthen the cornea to some extent thereby preventing the complications of trophic corneal ulcer 
and you can go for autologous serum drops which can be used or even the neuropeptides as well as the neurotrophins all these three options are in still in the experimental stage but they have found success to some extent but still they are in the experimental stage and you can go for the amniotic membrane transplantation wherever there is large epithelial defect of the cornea and in the treatment the tarsorophy with the punctal occlusion needs a special mention the tarsorophy either the medial tarsorophy or the lateral tarsorophy you can try along with the punctal occlusion so with this procedure of tarsorophy and the punctal occlusion there is decreased tear film evaporation and decreased osmolarity of the tear film so if you remember in the pathogenesis we had the increased tear film osmolarity as one of the causes so this is acting at that point thereby preventing or treating the trophic corneal ulcer so when you do the tarsorophy it should be intact or should be there in place for one year along with the treatment of dry eye that is with the lubricating eye drops in spite of all this if the cornea is not healing you can go for the contact lens usage the contact lens should be of low water content and high oxygen permeability contact lenses the last resort is either you can go for the conjunctival flap or the penetrating keratoplasty so these are the treatment options which are available for trophic corneal ulcer so coming to this relay day syndrome i thought of explaining this because this is frequently asked in your mcq questions which are all the features or the characteristics of this relay day syndrome okay so the relay day syndrome also called as familial dysautonomia are also called as hereditary sensory and autonomic neuropathy type 3 okay so this is usually autosomal recessive in character mostly seen in jewish descent people there is a lacrimia okay and there is vasomotor instability features are like decreased or absent deep tendon reflex there is impaired taste sensation because of absent lingual papillae okay and there is relative indifference for the pain and the temperature these are the overall clinical features of the relay day syndrome that is there was a lacrimia vasomotor instability decreased or absent deep tendon reflexes impaired taste sensation and relative indifference to the pain and temperature if you come to the eye proper what features we have and in the eye usually there will be persistent dramatic non healing epithelial defects in the infants okay so the epithelium defect will not heal so that may hint towards the relay day syndrome there is decreased aqueous part of the tear production because of the a lacrimia and hence the features of all the dry eye and there can be persistent epithelial erosions which will ultimately lead to the ulcer formation in the, the center of the inferior half of the cornea so these are the features of relay day syndrome so hope this video on neurotrophic corneal ulcer as well as a short note on the relay day syndrome is very helpful to all of you if you like my videos please do subscribe to my channel press the bell icon for further notifications please do like and share my videos and leave your valuable comments in the comment section thank you so much